This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, boy, do I have an extra special guest. John Mack, legendary CEO of Morgan Stanley. Man, this is just a master class on leadership, on team building, on understanding a business and understanding what to do for your clients. So not only that they give you business, but they give you their loyalty and their ongoing respect. I don't know what else to say other than my conversation with Morgan Stanley's John Mack. I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite a while. As soon as I saw the book came out, I was, <laughs> I have to really get the inside dope from John. And so let's start with the beginning. You started Smith Barney in 1968. What was so compelling about a North Carolina kid from Duke going to Wall Street? Well, it's pretty simple. So I was on scholarship at Duke, an athletic scholarship, and cracked C5 in my neck. So my scholarship was only uh, valid for four years, and I needed one class to graduate. I had very little money. My father had passed away when I was in college, so I needed a job. And I went down and knocked on the door at a company called First Securities of North Carolina. And a guy named Bill Bonner said, look, you know nothing about the business. I'll put you in the back office, and you can go to your one class every day I had, and they go in your lunch hour and come back and go to work. So it was me and nine women in the back office, and they had the old IBM computer punch cards. That's how long ago it was. So I got a sense and a feel for the business, and I got to know a lady named Fanny Mitchell, who ran job placement for Duke University. So when people would come down and say, you know, Procter & Gamble or IBM, whoever it may be, she would say, the guy you got to talk to is John Mack. And I think, you know, I would see her in the cafeteria, and most students would ignore her. I'd sit down and have a cup of coffee with her or have lunch with her. So that's how I got involved with the securities business. And then uh, Smith Barney was in town, and they were going to open an office in Atlanta. And they ended up hiring me to go to their Atlanta office. So I come up to New York in 68, and um, I'm working at Smith Barney, and they decide because of the explosion of volume, the New York Stock Exchange stopped all new branches from opening. Mm -hmm. So I got a chance to go into the municipal bond department. That's what I did. I was a trader salesman, and I learned a lot about risk, and I also learned a lot about drinking at lunch. Mm -hmm. And you got to be very careful. <laughs> Going out with clients, having a couple of drinks. Hey, you come back to the desk a little uh, buzzed. What happens? Can't you make a trading mistake that way? Well, not only you can, I did. Uh, we went down to Shea Yvonne, if you remember that, years ago down to Wall Street. It was U.S. Trust was my client, a guy named Jimmy Dagnan. And U.S. Trust was the advisor for the state employees of New York, which mm -hmm. is a huge pension Giant. Plan. So we sat there and we drank for at least three hours. And I now go, wait, are you normally a drinker during lunch? Or if the client is drinking, you got to keep up? I'm a client guy. Mm -hmm. No one wants to drink alone. So if he's drinking or she's drinking, I'm drinking. And I came back and I made a mistake. And uh, thank God they didn't fire me. And over time, we eradicated that <laughs> and fixed it. Uh, and then I learned, be very careful when you go out to lunch on Wall Street. So tell us a little bit about the culture on the street in the late 60s and early 70s. What was it like? It was a crazy time. The, the thing of um, politically correct didn't exist. To say the very least. All right, so I'm, I'm 21, 22 years old. I'm at Smith Barney. I'm a municipal trader. Uh, then I go into the corporate bond market, and I hear about these crazy parties that uh, Wall Street was, was throwing, and I only went to one and left. I mean, it was basically you know, strippers and people getting drunk, and you know, I came from a town of uh, about 12,000 people in North Carolina, a Baptist religion mainly. <laughs> it was a new world for me, but it, it taught me a lot. You gotta pay attention, and you gotta make sure that you don't uh, get drunk at lunch, and you gotta make sure you tell the truth. Telling the truth is certainly a key part, and that's a theme that comes up again and again in your book. We'll get to that in a little bit. You mentioned the New York Stock Exchange didn't allow any new branches to be open. 
I have a vague recollection of Wall Street being closed on Wednesdays to catch up on the paperwork. Tell us a little bit about that. That's correct. They closed on Wednesday to catch up on the paperwork, and all the firms, whether it was First Boston, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and Morgan Stanley at that time didn't have a big secondary business, we had to clear up the back office. So you'd shut at noon and try to figure out, all right, these securities go to Y and these securities go to Z. Literally paper certificates, Abs- runners up absolutely. and down the street, absolutely. hand delivering. Absolutely. Talk about you know ancient technology. One of the things you mentioned was that by the 1980s, there were two key forces driving changes on Wall Street, deregulation right. and technology. Correct. Tell us about that. Well, the markets were changing. They were global. And uh, as they became global and you were competing around the world, it was clear that you needed to free up our securities business to be more active on a global basis. So we got rid of a lot of regulation. We got more oversight, but n- not regulatory control. I mean, clearly we reported to the SEC, New York Stock Exchange, et cetera. But it wasn't smothering. I mean, you know, we were not used to it. But it was the right thing for uh, New York Stock Exchange to do. There had to be more regulation. And, uh, you know, it was a, as I said earlier, it's a global market, and you want to make sure that we represented New York Stock Exchange and really America the proper way. And it, and it worked. And the U.K. was much stricter than we were. And in Germany, they were stricter than we were. And clearly, the Japanese were stricter than we were. And over time, all these different regulatory areas from around the world came up with a conclusion we need kind of an overall management system for risk and regulatory oversight. So if you took a big risk in China and Japan or in Europe, you needed to roll that up so the U.S. regulator or the U.K. regulator could see what your overall risk was. I think that was a huge and a very important move. You spent the first part of your career primarily in fixed income. First, you mentioned municipals, right. then corporate. What was the appeal of the bond side of the business? Well, originally when I joined Smith Barney, I, I was going to go to Atlanta in the retail office and cover Florida and other other southern states. And then I got to know a guy named George Wilder, who had been in the municipal bond business, and a guy named John McDougal, who was a municipal bond trader. And they convinced me, you know, why don't you stay in New York? You're a great salesman, and you can sell and trade munis with us. And I like New York, and I like the business, and I like the uh, investment world of large pension funds, money managers, and things like that. So we did a combination of things. We covered clients, and then we satisfied the desire of retail salesmen who wanted to buy munis in New York State or in California or Florida. So that's how I got into the bond business. What was it like trying to build a team on a bond desk that you describe in the book could get a little frenetic? Yeah, it was. But, you know, we built it over a long period of time, and we all grew up over that period of time. And you learned that, number one, you had to be upfront. You had to focus on your clients. You couldn't get drunk at lunch, which occasionally we all got drunk at lunch and sometimes made a mistake. And you learned to focus on your client. And, uh, you know, it became a very personal business. And you got to know who they were. You got to know their families. And I remember uh, when I was at Smith Barney and then at F.S. Smithers, I was given the worst accounts because I went from trading to sales, so we'll dump all these accounts on John Mack. Give it to the kid. You got it. And uh, there was a gentleman named Dick Van Scoy at the Mellon Bank Mm -hmm. who managed and advised the state employees of Pennsylvania teachers and retirement funds. That's a big account in Pennsylvania. But he was tough as nails. And you learned very quickly that you better be on your toes when you dealt with Dick. And I got to know him. He was a great mentor, taught me a lot about the business. And I spent a lot of time in Pittsburgh, even to the point that my wife and I would go out. I mean, I remember going out to Pittsburgh with these huge funds. It was probably it was probably the largest account in the country, the Mellon Bank at the time. Really? And a guy named Jackie Kugler at Solomon Brothers, and Solomon was the dominant player in the bond market. They were the number one broker, banker. Mm-hmm. for the pension funds for the state of, of Pennsylvania, both the teachers and the employees. And I just kept digging away, working hard at it. And over time, I became their number one uh, dealer they dealt with. 
And George Polachek, who came over from the Ukraine after the Russians back then took over in World War II, was uh, running it. He had been at Sun Life in Canada. And I got along with him well, and I did a lot of business with the Mellon Bank to the point I became their number one broker-dealer. And Polachek, uh, who loved martinis, uh, walked onto the Solomon floor and screamed out to Kugler, how does it feel to be number two? <laughs> That's the environment we're in. And I'll tell you, I mean, uh, I think business is personal. And uh, we got to know the people at Mellon Bank, whether it was, you know, uh, Sally Ye's daughter who was in med school or George Polachek who was going back over to Europe for a while. Uh, we really worked at getting to know people and building trust. And at the end of the day, it's all about trust, and it's all about delivering on what you say you're going to do. And with the help of a lot of people, that's what we did. And, of course, my partner in all this was Christy Mack. And as I said earlier, my clients say, look, John, we, don't, we really don't care about you. Send Christy out. <laughs> <laughs> Your wife. Yeah. No. <laughs> she was awesome and is awesome. So you eventually become head of the fixed income department. Right. And what was it like to go from sales and trading to managing a whole team of salespeople and traders? Well, it was very different. And I learned very quickly, thank God for Dick Fisher, that you have to be more balanced and not as, um, I don't know if the word is aggressive, ruthless, uncouth, all of those words. Uh, we used to sit in uh, clusters of four salespeople together, mm -hmm. and we probably had five clusters. And one of my rules were that the desk can never be empty. You always need one person there mm -hmm. because, you know, if no one's there and the phone rings, no one's picking it up. Right. Occasionally, you know, no one was there. And I'd walk in and be really pissed off about it and reach over, and I would just clean the desk off. Like wipe everything Every onto night. the floor. Right. And uh, thank God for Dick Fisher. I mean, he said, look, John, you got the biggest gun in the firm in that division. Your job is never use your gun. <laughs> so I learned a lot from him, and I calmed things down. I wasn't as aggressive, wasn't as pushy, but I was still demanding. And look, it, it's a great business with great opportunities, but you got to pay attention. Mm -hmm. you got to pay attention to the people around you. you got to pay attention to your clients. And this idea of, especially at Morgan Stanley, the surest way to be fired at Morgan Stanley is the word got back, you got a client laid somewhere. Mm -hmm. You're gone. There's no debate, no discussion. So we really focused on trying to get close to our clients, give them what they needed, introduce them to other clients that also had similar uh, asset management responsibilities, and Morgan Stanley at the time was really growing from a pure investment bank that covered, you know, AT&T, IBM, Southern Cal, you name it, they had it, the government of Japan. And we really worked at imbuing that culture of first-class business in a first-class way into the Morgan Stanley sales and trading business. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things you discuss in the book. You describe how different Wall Street is today from when you began. Tell us a little bit about the process of finance being institutionalized and how the culture has changed. Well, I think the biggest change is the markets became so big and global that Wall Street had to change. So if you go back to when I started the business, basically your client base was here in, in the United States. But over time, as globalization took place, your clients would be all over the world. And uh, people were more and more focused on what are the maximum returns we can make in investing. And it got to be a 24 hours a day trading, whether you're in, in China or Japan or Europe or US. So you had to be on your game and you also had to be available to do business at night. And our traders oftentimes would stay up all night to satisfy inquiries coming in from China or be there early in the morning for London. So globalization was the big change. And then technology added to it. Technology allowed people to see markets. And here we are at Bloomberg. They were looking at machines. They could tell you what was going on in, in Hong Kong or what was going on in Europe. So the markets became 24-7. And as a result, you had to staff 
in, in my case, a fixed income division, you needed people around the world to be able to satisfy clients who are investors and at the same time satisfy clients who are raising money through Morgan Stanley. So if AT&T was doing a, bond, a big bond deal, we want to make sure that, you know, the Japanese, the Chinese, and just go around the world, the Middle East, London, and back to New York, that all of our clients got a chance to see and talk to a salesman who had information about the transaction we were doing for AT&T. So globalization was the big change. Then add to that, and here we are at Bloomberg, technology. You know, when I got into business, there was no technology. You had a little machine that would do uh, interest rates for, you know, you'd put in a price and it would give you what the yield is. But now you go into Morgan Stanley, you go into J.P. Morgan or Gold, makes no difference. Every desk has a box with data and information. And if you go back when I got in the business in, in the early, early 70s, uh, matter of fact, in the late 60s, that didn't exist. I mean, uh, people would go out for lunch and, and, you know, take a couple hours. You didn't miss anything. <laughs> but today, you don't leave your desk. Right, no, to say the very least. So you helped to build a very special culture at Morgan Stanley. What goes into building a competitive investment bank? How do you create and sustain that culture? Well, I think, by and large, uh, people who come into the business are competitive. They want to achieve and they want to do well. What I was trying to do was to, was to take all of this, um, I guess, courage is the wrong word, this aggressiveness, this ability to build business, and how do you make it into a one firm versus the guys in San Francisco, they get an order, don't share it with New York. If we do it, you know, we'll get more, more of a commission. So what I was trying to do when I took over the fixed income division is to create a one firm entity. I call it the one firm firm. And I brought in a guy named Tom DeLong, who I'd met on an airplane. So Christy and I were out in Utah. We were looking at uh, buying a house because we started picking up skiing. And, and by the way, I'm a terrible skier. Um, so I'm talking to this guy on the plane, and I said, well, what do you do? We said, I'm a professor at BYU, and I'm coming back to talk to AT&T and their management group about, you know, managing people and evaluations, et cetera. And I said, well, look, I'd like you to come in and see me when you have time. I'd like to talk to you. So Tom comes in. And by the way, now Tom is a professor at Harvard University. So Tom comes in, and he interviews uh, my senior group. And he comes in, and he said, well, here's what people think. To get ahead— at uh, this division, they have to be your friends. F-O-J. <laughs> exactly. That's right. And if they're not your friend, they don't make it. And he said, that may not be reality, but that's what they all believe. That's the perception. So he said, what you should do is set up an independent group of people. Let them make a presentation to you of the talent. It should be promoted. And, you know, if you have a strong objection, you can say that. But by and large, you should accept what they put in front of you. So that's exactly what they did. They took me picking who's going to be promoted, and there was a promotion committee and also a compensation committee, and then they would come to me and make recommendations. And so you didn't favor one person. You had somewhere between four and eight people on these committees, and when they brought it to me, unless I had something very specific that I'd say, well, let me tell you why I disagree, I accepted their recommendation. And that move really changed the culture of the division. And it came into, you know, you don't have to be Mac's friend or anyone else. It's about being professional, direct, and honest. And your peers would do the evaluation on how you're doing, what you're doing, and what you should be doing. This is the full 360 exactly. review. <laughs> and the peers would also anonymously review their managers. Absolutely. And what was the results from those sort of things? Well, in some cases, we found that managers uh, were not setting the right tone as far as being energetic and working with them. Uh, they were reluctant oftentimes to go out with salesmen and help them entertain with their clients or spend time with clients. So it really put more pressure on managers to be involved and not just sit in an office or on a trading desk at the far end and just, you know, take advantage of people working hard, but they're not involved. So it got them more involved. And it also got us to uh, eliminate some of the managers. When you saw these 360 reviews and some of the data, and then you, you would dive into it and find out they're right. 
we're, we're not going to have people like that at this firm. So not a lot of reduction in headcounts, but a few people we asked to leave. And you talk about um, the willingness of, of senior management to assist with clients. You seem to be ready to jump on a plane to go anywhere in the yeah. world, to China, to Tokyo. To, it didn't matter. If you could help close a deal, uh, you were there. Well, that's true. I mean, look, number one, I love the business. I mean, um, to go to China and build the relationships we built in China or go to Europe or it didn't make any difference where I went. I loved the business. And, you know, China was just opening up. And uh, one of the guys who used to be at the World Bank said, you know, John, what China really needs, uh, I think it was Ed Lim, it needs a, an investment bank. So we formed a small investment bank owned mainly by the Chinese, but Morgan Stanley owned 30% of it. And we built a securities business with the, with the Chinese in China, and Wan Shishan, who was the vice premier, he was the gentleman I worked with. And uh, it took a lot of time, but the Chinese wanted to create their own capital markets. They wanted to be independent, and they wanted the ability to go around the world and raise money, as we do in any American investment mm -hmm. bank. And I'll tell you one of the things that really touched me. Uh, we're talking about China, but let's say China communists. We're talking mm -hmm. about diehard communists. Wan Shishan, who was running the central bank at the time, and then he was given uh, the responsibility by Zhu Ranji to build a securities business. And I'm working with him to do this joint venture, and he flies over to New York, and we're sitting in my office on whatever floor at Morgan Stanley, and we're there for about an hour and a half. We're making zero progress. We're not getting anywhere. And I'd been in Europe with him and talked to him over there. We were making progress there. Now, here he is in New York. And it's like, there's like a big heavy stone on him. And I look at him and I finally figure out he's a chain smoker. <laughs> I said, Shishan, light him up. <laughs> he said, I can't do that. Uh, I said, what do you mean you can't do that? He said, in New York, you can't smoke inside. I said, in my office, you can do anything you want, light him up. And he, he smoked Luckies. Can you imagine smoking Luckies? He smoked Luckies. He lit him up. We got no, the deal. No filter, right? No filter. <laughs> we got the deal done. And I, I keep reflecting back, you got to pay attention to the person who's in the room with you. But I'm impressed that he knows the local rules and customs in New York. Yeah, very respectful. Uh, that's really impressive. So you opened this joint venture in China. Is Morgan Stanley the first U.S. bank to open a joint venture in China? It was. I'm, I know the U.K. banks, Hong Kong uh, bank, had a, a, a U.K. ownership but we were the first bank. But, you know, I'm sure J.P. Morgan had some kind of uh, outlet there, but more for banking and, and taking deposits and doing traditional banking business. But from a uh, trading point of view, securities business, thanks to Ed Lim, who, as I said, worked at the U.N., said, you know, China really needs capital markets. It needs investment banking business. And with his help, we started a small investment bank there, which continued to grow. So not just the division in China grew, but all of Morgan Stanley grew. And eventually you came to realize, hey, we have all this investment banking and trading experience, but we don't have a retail force the way somebody like Merrill Lynch does. And lo and behold, along comes Dean Witter, right. potentially um, a, a great merger um, candidate. Tell us a little bit about why that seemed like a good idea at the time. Sure. Well, what we saw in Merrill Lynch, which traditionally had been a pure retail firm, because of their uh, huge network, number one, they had better information, not only from what's going on in the retail market, but also from institutions. You know, if you were in Des Moines, Iowa, and you knew the local president of the First Bank of Iowa, you got better information, and if they were going to buy treasury securities or municipals, you got that order. So we saw that we were getting limited information. And then um, Sears, uh, who had bought uh, Dean Witter, uh, I think it was Ed Brennan, and uh, Phil Purcell had been a management consultant, I think from McKinsey, but not sure of that. And he, he convinced Ed Brennan that, you know, if you really are going to be in retail— you have Sears stores everywhere. Every city of 100,000 people, there was a Sears store. And he said, you know, we ought to open up uh, Dean Witter offices in all these, these Sears stores. And that's what they did. 
and it grew and grew. And then they came to the point that uh, Purcell had convinced Sears, let's spin it out and take this company public. So Morgan Stanley was chosen to be the lead underwriter on the spin out of Dean Witter from Sears. So Dick Fisher calls me in, I meet Purcell, who I liked, and I looked at their business and the information they were getting from clients versus what we were getting. They were in every, well, how many Sears stores are there? They were everywhere. At their peak, I think there were like 3,000, yeah. something crazy. So they had better information. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we talked uh, and talked, and finally uh, we came to the conclusion on a handshake to do the deal. Uh, Sears and Dean Witter was much larger in market cap than Morgan Stanley. So it was agreed upon, uh, and he wouldn't do it without being uh, the CEO. And uh, uh, we had a couple of dinners in New York with Dick Fisher and, and him, uh, Ed Brennan. And the, to get the deal done, he had to be the CEO. So uh, Fisher says to me in a private meeting in his office, uh, I'm not going to let you do this trip or do this management training. I said, well, Dick, uh, no, it's not our firm. It's shareholders' firm. And for me to say that, Dick Fisher... It was kind of ridiculous because he was always teaching me about the business. And he was a wonderful man and a smart man. So I said, look, this is what makes sense for shareholders. I'll take the uh, number two job. Uh, Phil's a good guy. I'll get along with him. And let's do this merger. And we did. And what we also inherited when we did that merger was the Discover card. Which was also a money machine. It, It was a money machine. Uh, but, you know, we clashed, and we clashed in the sense, like I said, I think earlier, if I were out in Sacramento seeing the state funds of California, and I had an extra hour, I would drop by, you know, the local office, the Morgan Stanley Dean Witter office, and go in and talk to the salesman. And clearly, you know, salesmen who are on commission, by and large, do a good job, but always have complaints. Mm-hmm. And I heard the complaints, and I came back, and I talked to the manager of all retail, and I talked to Purcell, and then Purcell said to me, you know, John, you can't do that. I said, what do you mean I can't do that? You can't just drop into an office and talk to them. I said, well, last time I checked, you know, you're the CEO, but I'm the president of the firm. I'm in Sacramento seeing Safeway stores, and you're telling me I can't go into the office and talk to them? He said, well, you know, Ed Brennan would never do that at Sears. And I said, you know, this is not Sears. <laughs> and uh, so right then we knew we had an issue. Right. He was very risk averse and you were very hands on. Right. It seems like from day one, a clash of the titans was teeing up. Yeah, but not from day one. I mean, look, they had built a great business in retail uh, mm-hmm. at Dean Witter. Uh, they had brokers all over the, the country uh, doing business. They didn't have an international business. Uh, I think they thought international was going to Canada. Um, <laughs> it, it was just two different cultures. Mm-hmm. And no one challenged or spoke up either to uh, a guy named uh, 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 Jimmy who ran the the, uh, the retail business or clearly Purcell who ran both retail institutional and the credit card business. And my view at Morgan Stanley, and I did this with Dick Fisher, and people did it with me. In in my office, I don't care what you say to me. I want to hear it. And at Dean Witter, you didn't do that. And that that was the big cultural change. So given the sort of head-to-head in terms of culture, Purcell's team, at least for a while, seemed to have won. You eventually came to realize he was reducing your authority Right. Step by step, and at a certain point, you're like, I don't want to just be a figurehead, right. and so you you resign. Right. Tell us what that was like. To you'd been at Morgan Stanley for quite a while. Yeah, well, it was difficult, but uh, I couldn't stay there um, under a philosophy or a management style where uh, you're not allowed to go to your boss and tell him, you know, I think you're a jerk. And I had a number of people say that to me. Uh, and I didn't get even with them. I just changed some of the things. Sometimes they were right. I was a jerk. Um, it just two different cultures. I mean, Morgan Stanley built its its business on telling clients exactly what they thought. They didn't sugarcoat it. They didn't try to say, you know, maybe a little of this, a little of that. They told the client, these are the issues. And that's the way I grew up, and that's the way Dick Fisher was. So, 
as much as I tried to uh, change, I just, I was miserable. I couldn't do it. And uh, he put me in charge of the retail system, but everything was bounced through him before I could make any decisions. Look, it's their style. They had been successful. Uh, the retail business was important uh, to the firm. And by putting retail and institutional together, we had tremendous clout. But from a managerial point of view, it's not a culture I want to be in. Let's talk a little bit about uh, a period where you were just bored golfing. You leave Morgan Stanley. You're really not sure what the next chapter in your life is going to be. And then you get a phone call about the mess that was Credit Suisse. What made you attracted to coming in and trying to clean up Credit Suisse First Boston? Well, I got a call from Lionel Pincus, and I, I assume— From uh, Warburg Pincus. Right. They had a big investment with the Swiss, and they were not happy what was going on. So I met with him, and um, then I met some of the uh, other people who in the management of, of Credit Suisse. And I said to Christy, I, I would rather do this job and regret it than not do this job and regret it. So that's how I made the decision. Regret minimization framework. That's exactly. A, a good way to think about it. We should talk more about your wife because it seems like she regularly gives you good advice and sends you off to apologize for something you said. That's true. Um, and you talk about that in the book. We'll, we'll circle back to that later. So I, I'm amused by the headline, Wall Street Fears Big Mac Attack. What was the expectation post-Morgan Stanley? What, what did the street think you're going to come in and do at Credit Suisse? Well, at, at Morgan Stanley, when I thought, especially in the fixed income division, uh, at that time that's the only thing I ran, uh, that we, we were too um, too fat. You know, We, we mm-hmm. needed to do a reduction. So I did. And, and this uh, isn't just headcount. This is you describe some pretty egregious spending oh, uh, yeah. going on at Credit Suisse. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was, it was totally out of control. And... Um, no, the Swiss were were uh, kind of absentee landlords, mm-hmm. and they they were used to uh, getting all this money in a Swiss bank account and <laughs> a lot of money coming, I assume, from other parts of the world. So it was pretty easy when I got there that we had to do some headcount reduction. When I got there, three of my bankers who had worked for me at Morgan Stanley um, were big in technology, Frank Quattrone sure, and giant. his team, and... Uh, when I saw what kind of money they were making, it was it was mind boggling. So uh, I flew out to see them, and uh, I said, "Look, guys, I'll pay you a lot of money. There's, there's no question about that. But what you're doing, and the amount of money you're making now versus the rest of the firm, and using the balance sheet of the firm is unacceptable. So we're going to have to figure out a way." I want you to make a lot of money. I think that's a great motivator, but this is totally out of control. And I wish I could remember exactly some of the numbers, but there were numbers like I'd never seen before. It was order of magnitudes larger than, than the rest of the street. Big. They, they got a piece of every deal they did. Personally. Personally. So, you know, one of them says, uh, you know, John, this is in our contract. Uh, but I think this compensation is is uh, way out of kilter. And just to add a little color to this, when I said to them, I want to come out and uh, I want you to come to New York and we got to talk about these contracts. And this was after 9-11. And they said, well, we're afraid to do that. I said, well, tell me why. Well, after 9-11, we don't go to New York. I said, okay, pick a city. I'll meet you in the city. So I met him in Denver. Now think about that, how absurd that is. Mm -hmm. So I flew out to Denver, and I took Steve Volk, who had been at Sherman and Sterling as the lead uh, lawyer, lead partner. He had joined me to help clean up uh, credit suites. So I sit with uh, George Boutrous, uh, Quattrone, and I think a guy named Brady. And I said, look, guys, I want you to make a lot of money. I don't have any issue with that. But this is craziness, and I, I can't do that. And they said, well, look, it may be craziness, but that's our contract. I said, it may be your contract, and uh, I'll see you in court, and we'll fight it out. And they gave up the contracts. But I still paid them a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But you can't can't create a culture when you have one-offs doing whatever they want to do. You described it as anyone with a personal fiefdom is a terrible idea for a firm. Absolutely. Huh. And they're good. They were smart. 
you, you would you would like a room full of, of Frank Quatrones. Mm-hmm. But you got to be managed, and you got to be a team player. So someone said to you around this time, "Hey, we're giving up a lot of money. What about you, John? What are you giving up?" Yeah. And what was your response? I gave up the contract. So you gave up about a third of your salary. Yeah, I did. That's a big chunk of cash. But if you're going to ask people to give up their contract, you can't be different than them. This term that I run from from Tom DeLong, it's a one firm firm. We all have to be in it together. So for me to keep the contract, it's just not the right thing to do. And, and also, I learned so much from Dick Fisher. I'm I'm looking way down the road. Mm-hmm. I'm not looking about what's going to happen next week or two weeks from now. Huh. Well, that's a, that's a good strategy in investing, to say the yeah. very the very least. You wrote in the book, the Swiss and Swiss bankers were unlike any other bankers you work with in the UK, in China, in Japan. What made the Swiss so much of a one-off? Well, they were very independent. Uh, They had uh, a lock on certain clients, whether it was uh, leaders out of the Middle East or out of uh, uh, oligarchs in Russia. They got a lot of money coming in because they were Swiss. Mm -hmm. Uh, They had a great franchise. And they really lived off their private banking business. And in their investment banking business, they had a guy who was very talented, very smart, named Alan Wheat, and they had other people that come in. But everyone was running it for their own return to, into their own pocket. Mm-hmm. And um, so when I got there, I, I, I cut commissions. I got Frank and his guys to give up some of their money. Um, and someone said, you know, we're cutting commissions and not getting less. Will you give up your contract? And I did. So it it just wasn't being managed. And the Swiss, uh, you know, they make a lot of money because they get money from all the places that maybe J.P. Morgan and others wouldn't take. They did a lot of investing with that money. They got to carry on some of it. Uh, it's a great, it's a great uh, system for running a very profitable business, but the world was changing. And disclosure was becoming more and more open. People want to know, you know, who has the money, where is it going, how is money being transferred. And uh, we finally got that to start moving and changing in, in Switzerland. And uh, I was pretty tough on them. And, of course, they thought I was the most arrogant person they ever met. <laughs> and I thought they were the dumbest people I ever met. So. And, and you, in the book, you <laughs> describe actually saying that to their face. I did. Given how secretive they are and how less than team focus they were you knew this match wasn't going to last forever right. how long did you last at credit swiss i think i lasted uh at least two years maybe three uh, long enough to start showing a profit and oh yeah the no, firm we, oh, we started making money it was great i mean <laughs> uh, i remember the oleon group out of the middle east said to me and they were a huge investor in credit suisse john you're doing a great job we're finally making money again but i can't take people telling me you know, you don't have access for this, you don't have access for that. My view, which drove them crazy, was to open up their vault and let the European Jews come in and see how much money <laughs> Credit Suisse <laughs> took when World War II started. Right. You know, how about the paintings they had? What's a bank doing with a Renoir in a, in a safe? What was the response to that? They didn't like it. Yeah, I can't, I, <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine. Yeah. So you end up leaving Credit Suisse not long after. Well, it, they wouldn't renew my contract. Right. So it wasn't like you were out and out fired. It was after your, your contract ended. No, I was fired. <laughs> <laughs> so so non-renewal. And what was the firing like? Tell us a little bit about that. Was it relatively polite and pleasant? The, the Swiss are, they're not quite German. They're not quite French. Their customs are a little bit different yeah. than the rest of Europe. Well, um, when I uh, went to Credit Suisse, I said I could pick someone that I liked and trusted, a friend, to go on the board. And I asked a guy named Tom Bell, who's mm-hmm. a close friend of mine. He used to run Y&R Advertising Agency, and then he ran Cousins Properties in, in Atlanta to go on the board. And he called me after their meeting and said, John, be prepared. They're going to fire you tomorrow. I said, well, thanks for the heads up. So I went in, and they fired me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I sat and I said, you know, Walter, what do you think of this? Trying to get them to talk. But they didn't want any part of talking. And look, you know, I, I don't, I don't have any issue with, I don't have an issue with them firing. I, mean, I was, I guess you could say, I was aggressive or obnoxious, one or the other. But we turned the place around. Right. We started making money. 
But um, look, I, I, I don't think in general, we have to ask my friends and people who know me, I don't think I'm arrogant, but clearly I came across as arrogant know-it-all. And they shot me, so, you know. But you had done a good job there. Let, let's talk a bit about Mac the Knife, right? right. So there's Chainsaw Al, there's Neutron <laughs> Jack. I don't get the sense that you were as blasé about having to reduce head counts as some other CEOs were. Yeah. It struck me that Mac the Knife sort of rankled you a little bit. In, at least that's how it comes across in the book. Yeah, I, I didn't mind it. I mean... Uh, being known as Mac the Knife, it kind of built a reputation for me. And, uh, you know, people would, I'd go to a bar somewhere, I'd go to a, a Christmas party with a lot of Wall Street guys, and invariably someone would be pointing and say, That's Mac the Knife. Right. You know, I, kind of, I have an ego. I like that. I am Mac the Knife. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's pretty good. So now you, you get fired at Credit Suisse. Yeah. And meanwhile, Morgan Stanley, run by the somewhat risk averse. Phil Purcell starts falling behind all their competitors. Right. And lo and behold, there is an agitation to uh, have some change at, right. at Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. Tell us what happens next. Well, I'm at Pequot, uh, which is a hedge fund with Art Sandberg, Art Sandberg right. and having a good time. And Morgan Stanley is falling behind. And then uh, Parker Gilbert, who had been the chairman of the firm, and I think uh, going all the way back, uh, his his stepfather was one of the original partners at J.P. Morgan, spun out and started Morgan Stanley. Well, wasn't he related to Henry Morgan also? I mean, I, that I, think... I don't know. I, I don't think so, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know that. Uh, Charles Morgan was related to Henry Morgan, who was not on the management committee, but there was a relationship going all the way back mm -hmm. to the Morgans. Uh, so Parker got together with a number of retired partners who own a tremendous amount of Morgan Stanley slash Dean Witter stock now. And they went on a campaign to force Purcell out. And at the end of the day, they were successful. And you get the phone call. Yeah. You, again, briefly thought about it. What does your wife say to you? <laughs> well, she said I had to do it. <laughs> she said, John. Uh, that firm is part of you, and you've done so much. Uh, you, you've got to go back and do this. So the two you return, right. your first day of work, you yeah. walk into the trading room to deliver a, just a, hey, I'm back. Right. What is that experience like? Well, I think uh, Christy would say, who's my wife, would say, other than having our kids, it was the happiest moment of her life. Mm -hmm. She would say that... Uh, John, we we grew up at Morgan Stanley. We knew the culture. And to come back and to have people just running to get to the door to welcome us in, it, it was emotional. It was, um, I, I guess a lot of it is is just the circumstances. They had been, they hadn't been managed the way I think they should have been managed. They had, didn't have a connection with the leadership of the firm. They had become risk averse, um, and it's it was no longer um, you know the sense of you do well you get rewarded. So the meritocracy thing had just dis dissipated away. So to to walk in and have people scrambling to you know get to see me or or uh, how to feel good. Yeah, it, it did it did good. Um, and I I never forget when I got up into the auditorium to talk to people and I said you know. I always wanted to see all of you again, but I never thought I would see you by coming back in here, back to Morgan Stanley and doing it. But it was a thrill. I mean, you know, you don't get many chances to redo or recorrect or change what had happened and go back the way it was. And we were able to do that, and it was it was a high. And you ought to get Christy in here. I mean, to her, other as I said, other than kids, that was the highlight of, of uh, our marriage. So I got to work on it, do some other things. <laughs> <laughs> and so. and I mentioned when you first came in, and I I'm sure you don't remember this. The day you were brought in, you were doing a media tour, and I have a vivid recollection of sitting in a makeup chair in the green room at CNBC. CNBC. And you and some other people blow in, hi, I'm John Mack. Right. Hi, nice to meet you. What was that about, I asked? And someone said, oh, that's John Mack. He just came back to run uh, Morgan Stanley. Right. I'm like, oh, isn't that great? And that was, <laughs> I don't know, was it 05? It was like 15, 17 yeah, years ago? Yeah, something like that, yes. Yeah, really, really fascinating. Um, 
And you very quickly rebuilt the firm's culture. Tell right. us what you did to bring back the one firm firm sure. and the meritocracy. How did you get Morgan Stanley back on the straight and narrow again? Well, number one, you had to return it to a meritocracy. Uh, we had a lot of meetings, either in big groups, small groups. Uh, Christy and I, uh, one of the things we did early on, if there was a golf outing at Morgan Stanley with clients, if you went to the outing, it would be all men. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's occasionally there would be one woman who played golf. So uh, Christy and I said, well, let's do things. I want women to be in charge of entertaining them and doing their own golf outings. So we got David Ledbetter and his guys to come in, and we did golf lessons up in Purchase, New York, for our women professionals. And then we took them down to North Carolina six or seven months later uh, at a club we belonged to called Landfall, and we had you know, the golf teachers come up and work with them. And the beauty of it is now the women have their own golf outing, women only, which I think is terrific. So what we try to do is pull people together and talk about how do you make this a great firm again? Because the roots are there, the, the bones are there. And it was about reaching out and bringing people together and working for our clients and making sure that we treated people, people fairly. Hmm. So there's a quote of yours in the book that I found fascinating. You wrote, certain risk-taking behavior multiplied exponentially when investment banks were converted from partnerships to publicly traded companies. I, I couldn't agree more. Right. Tell us your thoughts. Well, the thought was when it was the partner's money, uh, they were much more conservative. They were literally joint and several liability, literally on the hook Absolutely. if the firm lost money. That, uh, that's got to focus your attention oh, a little bit. Oh, it does. Bit. And depending where you were, which firm, uh, but the culture of Morgan Stanley had been a pure investment bank. And they really didn't have sales and trading, whether in equities or in, in fixed income. But what became apparent that firms like Solomon Brothers were making huge inroads because Jackie Kugler at Solomon could call the CFO at IBM or AT&T and say, hear what pension funds are thinking and doing with your stock. We think there's an opportunity you could float a $100 million equity deal or bond deal they had better information. And Morgan Stanley didn't have that sales and trading business. We were not talking to portfolio managers as traders. We were talking to them as we're pricing AT&T at 718s. How many do you want? Mm -hmm. That's the way it worked. But other firms, including Goldman Sachs, they were a two-way shop. They were buying and selling uh, debt and equities with pension funds and getting a lot of information what were they looking for and what were they doing? And then you take that back and you show it to New Jersey Bell Telephone or you show it to uh, you know, AT&T or IBM, you're bringing that CFO or that treasurer more information so he can figure out what's the next move for AT&T or Southern Bell. So was it inevitable that these firms had to go public just so they had access to those pools of capital to expand into – trading and underwriting and everything else. Yeah, because at the end of the day, the risk uh, component went up dramatically. And, uh, you know, if you go through the crisis, probably if you were not a public company, you'd have wiped out the partnership. Mm -hmm. So you needed to have a strong base of capital and sell in equity and be into the public market gave you that. It also gave you the liquidity to go in the market uh, to raise more equity if you needed or do a bond deal. I used to think, hey, big mistake going from partnership to public because right. of the change in, in risk profile. But it sort of sounds like it was inevitable that all these partnerships would eventually go public. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting, if you look at Lazard, they still do business, but it's truncated. It's not what it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a CFO or a CEO, you want to know what are the hedge funds doing? State of California, state of New York, big pools of money in their pension funds. What are they thinking? What do they need? You want that kind of data. You want to know what are investors looking for. And, and I think, you know, if you look back, and it was difficult. We went through a hard time. The Dean Witter merger really changed the firm. Mm -hmm. Now you had unbelievable banking with retail. And the amount of information that you could bring to a CEO or a CFO about markets and then the distribution network you now had 
was a huge advantage. And I think that's one of the reasons Morgan Stanley has done so well. Hmm, really interesting. We'll talk about books in a little while, but you seem to, throughout your book, quote Ron Chernow's House of Morgan a lot. Right. How helpful was that in doing your research to write this? Well, uh, I'd read the book years ago, so mm-hmm. I didn't do a lot of work to, to dig down. So uh, I would say very little. Oh, really? Yeah. Because he just goes berserk on the research side. Right. Everything he does is so deeply yeah. and richly uh, researched. It, it, See, I he, guess... was never, he was never a bond salesman like me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you were actually on the inside, so it's a little different. <laughs> One of the other things you wrote was everybody got the financial crisis wrong in, in the run-up to it. People just didn't expect the bottoms to drop out that much. Tell us a little bit about what took place with Morgan Stanley uh, leading up to the financial crisis. Well, number one, uh, we had too much risk. Uh, There was no question about that. But we were not alone. And uh, we did not have a fortress balance sheet like a J.P. Morgan would have Mm -hmm. or or even a Citibank. You know, no one knows when the bullet's coming, but the bullet came and and shot a lot of us. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these companies either merged or went out of business. And uh, all I can say is is thank God for uh, the Japanese and what they did. I Mm -hmm. mean, that was the lifesaver. That got us through. And as Bank I, of Mitsubishi yeah. with Morgan Stanley. And, and as I said to you earlier, they remembered our culture because we would always have Japanese trainees. Mm-hmm. And they stood up, and that's what saved us. So you tell a story in the book. You have Hank Paulson, Ben Bernanke, and Tim Geithner coming to you to say, hey, you guys have to find a merger partner. Right. And your response is, we have $180 billion in capital. This is going to be a painful period, but we'll survive. Right. What was their response? They didn't care. Didn't care. No. Get no. more capital. Absolutely. So you reach out to Bank of Mitsubishi, right. and you're waiting for the term sheet to come in. Right. And it's midnight, and it's 2, and it's 4 a.m., and it's 6 a.m., and then Tim Geithner calls, and then Hank Paulson calls, and right. then a, a third time Tim Geithner calls. What happens next? Well, what happens, the uh, check flew in to Boston. Mm-hmm. And we had to send one of our bankers uh, up to pick up the check and fly back. So uh, he was at home. It was on the weekend. <laughs> and he went up in his uh, dungarees and, and running shoes and picked up a check for, I don't know, a billion sum <laughs> and, and brought it down. I got it. I got it, a copy of it framed in my office back at the townhouse. The Japanese saved us. They saved us because they they remember our culture. And we used to train tons of uh, Japanese bankers at Morgan Stanley. So you're you're waiting for the final word from Bank of Mitsubishi. I right. think you know where I'm going. Yeah. And now Geithner calls for the umpteenth time, and your secretary pokes her head in and right. says, it was the head, head of New, New York, York Fed, Fed right. Tim Geithner, and he's insistent. Right. And you basically said, we're going to figure this out ourselves, yeah. and you did. And we did. Yeah. And what's your relationship with Tim now? I like Tim. I mean, yeah. listen, to me, I hope it's not personal to him. And, and the point was, I'm trying to save the firm. I can't p- take all these calls when I'm talking to the Japanese. So, you know, we're under the gun. He, he's a decent guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he had his job to do, and I had my job to do. And um, at the end of the day, it worked. So, uh, and in fact, uh, the Treasury Department taps Morgan Stanley to help with the AIG bailout. Yeah, they did. So that was a good uh, working relationship. You actually had a good relationship with Hank Paulson from when he was CEO of Goldman. Yeah, he's the best. Well, look, he's honest. Mm -hmm. He's smart. He's straightforward. He gets things done. I have a lot of respect for Hank Paulson. Hmm. Uh, Before we get to our favorite questions, there were a couple of little curveballs I wanted to throw you um there's a story in the book you talk about somebody who you go to who you know is a giant duke basketball fan and you ask him to give up part of his bonus as you were doing and very begrudgingly he did it for the team right and then you get coach k involved tell us that story it's charming well he he was a huge fan of duke and uh i needed him on board with what i was trying to do and he gave up uh, some power and money to uh, accommodate me. And uh, Mike Krzyzewski is a good friend of mine, a close friend of mine. So I called Coach K and I said, Mike, do me a favor. Will you call this gentleman and just tell him 
how much um, uh, I appreciate what he's done and that you are happy that you helped my friend John Mack out. So Mike calls the guy and he said, look, um, I want to tell you what you did is uh, really something. John Mack is, um, he didn't call me an a-hole. He said, John Mack is a selfish, tough guy. And what you did just warmed his heart. And I want to thank you because he's my friend. The salesman was on cloud nine. I, I can imagine. And then and then, another curveball i got to ask you. Sure. You once stole Barton Biggs' car? <laughs> we hit it. <laughs> His car was a dump. All right. right. He, <laughs> it was a clunker. He had a broken rear rear window. Yeah. He just taped it up. Yeah. He didn't even replace exactly. the window. Yeah, we hit the car. And he was glad. <laughs> And then you had a, a make-believe sheriff from right. North Carolina yeah. call him. Yeah. And and what was his reaction? Well, he, he laughed at the end, but he had no idea what was going on. And Barton is a wonderful man, but he's a good guy to pull pranks on. So it, what, what I've learned in pulling pranks— Of which there are numerous examples in the book. But the, here's what I've learned, though. When the prank is on you, mm-hmm. laugh. <laughs> Because everyone's trying to get me some way or one way or another. Very, very funny. So we only have a few minutes left. Sure. Let me, uh, let me jump to some of my favorite questions that we ask all of our guests. Uh, tell us about your early mentors who helped to shape your career. Uh, number one, Dick Fisher. Mm-hmm. Just, just hands down, he would call me and say, look, John, you got to do this. I know you're aggressive. You're a great salesman. You can't manage people and try to threaten them and scare them. you got to ease up. Uh, so he did that. He also, I could go to him if I had a problem, a question. So he, he was without question my best mentor. And, and the other person who's not that she mentored me, she's my wife, she would say, John, you know, you, you ought to reach out to that person. And, you know, their kid's sick. You've got them into Children's Hospital, the Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital. Uh, so she's been a, a wonderful partner in telling me, you know, you're being a little too aggressive back mm-hmm. down. And, and I think, I think she's right. I, I've uh, have I softened up? Yeah, I think I have softened up. And, and that's another thing. Um, Morgan Stanley got behind us, and we built this children's hospital, mm-hmm. which the employees love. They go up there on the weekends and they read stories to kids. Wow, that's how you build a culture that you do things like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm trying to think, Frank Bennett, who's at the Hearst Corporation, said to me, he thought that was the best sign of corporate philanthropy he's ever seen. So if sometime you're up uh, near New York Presbyterian uptown, if you go into the Children's Hospital, the Morgan Stanley Children's, you'll see on the wall that Morgan Stanley gave a lot of money. And then you'll see names of hedge funds and other clients when they heard what we were doing, they gave money. And, you know, New York is huge. You got, you know, Philadelphia Children's Hospital. You got them in Boston. New York City didn't have a standalone children's hospital. Mm-hmm. And our employees will go up there now and read books to the kids on the weekends sometimes. Wow. It, it's a wonderful thing we did. We, it's, we we're really, really happy with it. You should be very proud of that. You mentioned books. Let's talk about some of your favorites and what are you reading currently? Well, uh, actually, I just read my book again. My, my favorite book all time is Gone with the Wind. Can uh-huh. you believe that? That's a big book, right? It is a big book. So I'm taking History of the South at Duke University. Mm-hmm. And one of the things you had to do, you had to read 50 pages uh, every other day about a history or something with the South. So I picked up Gone with the Wind. I didn't put it down until I finished it. Really? Wow. If you haven't read it, you got to read it. Seen the movie, never read the uh, book. Book's awesome. Huh, really? It's, That's it's just awesome. What sort of advice would you give to a recent college graduate who is interested in a career in finance or investing? Well, number one, you have to pursue it. Uh, you got to get in the door. Hopefully, you have a background that will help you. If your education, let's say you're a history major, I was a history major. If your uh, education doesn't put you naturally into that glide path, then take courses and get into that glide path. Go to school at night, get your MBA, that helps. But more importantly, figure out how do you get to know people within that company. Uh, Make sure your job you have now, you've performed well in it. And get to know people in the company and get introduced by them to uh, the head of a division or a department. 
But you can get in it. I mean, there's a lot of ways to get in this business. And, and one way of doing it, go work for uh, J.P. Morgan, their asset management business. Go work for a hedge fund. Go work for a lot of people who are in the business and learn kind of the day-to-day -day sales and trading business. And if you want to be an M&A specialist, you know, my advice is you need to have a degree in, in accounting or an MBA where you can really zero in and have the training that you need to do, do that. You, you can do that business if you didn't have any experience, if they give you a chance. My point is you've got to give them enough information that they want to give you a chance. And the way you do that is do extra work or work for a hedge fund or work for you know whoever it may be, and you'll get that shot. And our last question, what do you know about the world of investing today that you wish you knew 50 years or so ago when you were first getting started? That great companies that you invest in, you should hold. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always was looking for the profit. And uh, I made money on it. But some of these companies, well, take Apple Computer. Perfect example. I'll give you a great, great example. My son, 11 years old, Morgan Stanley takes Apple Computer public. I buy him a computer. He says, Dad, this is a great company. I want to buy stock in it. Uh, and he's like 11 or 12 years old, and he buys shares in it. I think that small purchase is well worth over a couple million dollars wow. when he did. So he, he understood great companies, and his father didn't. You hold them. He's never sold a share. Wow. And it's just been a home run. So I believe... Well, dad's a trader. The son's an investor. An investor. That's right. A smart, smart investor. So I, I, I believe you buy great companies and hold them. And that's what we do now. We have a family office that helps me and we work with mm -hmm. them. And we still meet and talk to a lot of investors. Quite fascinating. John, thank you for being so generous with your time. We have been speaking with John Mack, former CEO of Morgan Stanley and author of the fascinating book, up Close and All In, Life and Leadership Lessons, really, from a Wall Street warrior. If you enjoy this conversation, well, be sure and check out any of our previous 500 we've done over the past eight or nine years. You can find those at iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Sign up for my daily reading list at Ritholtz.com. Follow me on Twitter at Ritholtz. Check out all of the Bloomberg podcasts on Twitter at podcasts, I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps put these conversations together each week. Justin Milner is my audio engineer. Atika Valbron is my project manager. Sean Russo is my head of research. Paris Wald is my producer. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio. 